Hello and welcome to the Electronics Cooling Webinar, Advanced Thermal Management Materials and Applications. My name is Belinda Stasiukiewicz and I'm an editor at Electronics Cooling. Electronics Cooling has delivered up-to-date information and practical articles on thermal management since 1997. This webinar is presented by Carl Zwieben, Advanced Thermal Materials Consultant. Carl has directed development and application of advanced electronic packaging and thermal management materials for over 35 years. He was formerly Advanced Technology Manager and Division Fellow at GE Astrospace, where he directed the Composite Center of Excellence. Carl is a Life Fellow of ASME, a Fellow of ASM and SAMPI, an Associate Fellow of AIAA, and has been a Distinguished Lecturer for AIAA and ASME. This webinar is sponsored by Berquist. Innovation, performance, and customer satisfaction are Berquist's guiding principles. Berquist Thermal Products Group is the world-leading developer and manufacturer of thermal management materials. Now Carl will begin the presentation. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. We are gratified by the large international audience for this webinar. I'm going to talk about a rapidly developing technology in which I've been involved for many years. This is a, a large, complex subject, and we will only be able to touch on a few highlights. Uh, more information is available on the Electronics Cooling website. These are the topics that we'll be talking about today. A uh, brief introduction to the thermal uh, management problem. We'll, we will then look at traditional thermal management materials to form a reference for our discussion of advanced thermal management materials. After that, we'll take a look at a few uh, applications of these materials to give you a feel for where they're being used. And then finally, a brief look at future directions, and then, of course, a summary and conclusions. Reducing size, weight, and power is a key driver for many aerospace defense and commercial applications. Thermal management is a critical issue in achieving these goals. In addition to heat dissipation, thermal stresses are a major problem. They result in warping, fracture, fatigue failure, and creep. Thermal stresses are caused primarily by coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch between the different materials used. This is an old Air Force slide going back to the 1980s, which shows a ceramic package um, attached to a fiberglass printed circuit board. And because of the different coefficients of thermal expansion between the ceramic and the fiberglass, there are large thermal stresses induced uh, at when the temperature is uh, cycled. Heat dissipation is complicated by higher ambient temperatures, such as automotive underhood applications, aircraft engine sensors, and so forth. 3D packaging also is imposing significant thermal management challenges. Another uh, area uh, for which heat dissipation is critical uh, is high power gallium nitride and silicon carbide semiconductors and advanced thermal materials such as diamond composites are being used in these applications. Higher lead-free solder process temperatures also serve to increase um, thermal stresses. Weight or mass is important in a number of applications, certainly many aerospace defense systems, portable commercial and consumer systems, uh, systems for which vibration is an issue, and even if weight is not important uh, by itself, when um, systems are subjected to shock loads during a shipment, for example, uh, or drop loads, um, the mass of the parts is a significant issue. And finally, cost is, is a critical item, uh, as everybody knows. Thermal problems are similar for all semiconductors, both microelectronic and photonic. So the microelectronic includes power, uh, semiconductors, microprocessors, RF applications. Uh, the photonics include things like diode lasers, light-emitting diodes, displays, 
uh, thermoelectric coolers, and so forth. And we find that in all of these applications, advanced thermal materials are widely used. There are numerous traditional new there are numerous traditional and new thermal materials. Many engineers, I find, are only familiar with copper and aluminum. Unfortunately, time constraint limits coverage of both traditional and advanced materials, so we will select, I have selected a number of uh, materials for discussion. There's more complete coverage in one to three, uh, one day to three day short courses that I teach uh, both in-house and for various technical organ and commercial organizations. In addition, I have some papers on the subject that I'll be happy to send you if you uh, contact me. This webinar focuses on materials used in heat sinks, heat spreaders, enclosures, etc. There are other classes of um, materials, thermal materials, such as thermal interface materials. We'll touch on them briefly, but we'll not be discussing them in this course. This is another slide that uh, goes back to the 1980s, uh, an Air Force slide that I've modified slightly. Talks about the different packaging levels. Level one is the package. Level two is a printed circuit board or a support plate. And often in aerospace applications, there's a heat sink or cold plate, sometimes called a thermal plane attached. Level three is a subsystem uh, enclosure, chassis. And uh, finally, level four, I've added a support structure. And advanced materials are being used in all four levels. Carl, I'd like to interrupt you for a minute to ask a poll question to our viewers. Attendees, please answer the following question. Thank you. Would your designs benefit from materials with thermal conductivity higher than that of copper? Yes or no? Thank, Thank you, Belinda. for participating in our poll. Let's take a look at <clears throat> traditional thermal management materials. What we're trying to uh, package are semiconductors and ceramic substrates, which we find have coefficients of thermal expansion in the range of 2 to 7 parts per million per degree Kelvin. So to minimize thermal stresses, we would like to have thermal materials that match these um, CTEs, 2 to 7 parts per million per degree Kelvin. Here we have a list of uh, key traditional thermal and packaging materials, copper, aluminum, cobar, a nickel iron alloy, titanium, uh, tungsten, molybdenum, copper tungsten, which is actually a metal, com metal composite, molybdenum copper, again another composite material, Copper invar copper, which is the laminate, copper moly copper, which is another laminated material. And finally, we have e-glass epoxy. And a couple of significant things here. The um, typical K or thermal conductivity is extremely low. It's actually really practically a thermal insulator. And if you look at the literature, uh, as I've done over the years, you find a tremendous range of reported coefficients of thermal expansion. I've found numbers from 12 to 24 which is a factor of 100% difference uh, based on the lower, no, lower number. Typical numbers would be in the range of 17 to 18. And you can see on the, right on the right side the specific gravities. So what's wrong with traditional materials? The key problem with copper and aluminum is that they have high CTEs, coefficients of thermal expansion. Copper is 17 parts per million per degree Kelvin. Aluminum is 23 parts per million per degree Kelvin. And remember, we, our goal is something in the range of 2 to 7. The result is that um, we get thermal stresses and warping. And to minimize the thermal stresses and warping, we have to use underfills and or compliant thermal interface materials, 
typically abbreviated TIMS, thermal interface materials. And they are things like greases, polymeric TIMS, and also solders. Uh, another problem with copper is that it also has a fairly high density, three times that of aluminum. So what's wrong with greases? They are messy to apply. Um, they suffer from dry out and pump out. Um, Silicone-based materials uh, have problem with migration of the silicone. Other compliant polymeric TIMs, um, the biggest, often they are the biggest contributor to the total system thermal resistance. They have generally high low thermal conductivities and high contact resistance. Compliant, or also called soft solders, which are mostly Indian based, uh, are widely used. The prob several problems with compliant solders. They have poor fatigue life, which is because of their low yield stresses. And uh, that's what we mean by soft solders, low yield stress. And when we, we um, load Metal, metallic materials above the yield stress, we get uh, fatigue failure problems. Other problems are creep, formation of intermetallics, corrosion, electromagnation, electro uh, migration, and they're fairly expensive. If we look at traditional low CTE materials, they all have sufficient deficiencies. Covar, Covar alloy 42, are uh, nickel iron based alloys. We have titanium, uh, third uh, low CTE material. They all have very low thermal conductivities, roughly in the range of 10 to 20 parts per million per degree Kelvin. In comparison, aluminum's 200, copper's 400. They have high densities, uh, except for titanium, they're, and they're hard to machine. Tungsten copper, molybdenum copper, copper and bar copper, and other uh, laminated materials. Most have thermal conductivities that are less than or equal to those of aluminum alloys. They have high densities, they're hard to machine, and they are expensive materials. The, uh, the bottom line is that for the best thermal characteristics, uh, we would like to have direct attach with hard solders. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we have to have a C, either a CTE match or use uh, underfill. This is one of the uh, widely used traditional thermal materials, copper tungsten, uh, which is a, actually a, a family of materials which are metal-metal composites rather than alloys. The tungsten is not dissolved in the copper. And by varying the weight ratio, we can vary the CTE from that of um, pure tungsten to that of pure copper. So this is a, a widely used family of materials, but as you see on the right side, uh, the copper tungsten materials all have thermal conductivities no better than those of aluminum alloys. Uh, printed circuit board materials such as FR4 are extremely widely used, as everybody knows. Uh, basic problem, as I mentioned before, is that they have high coefficients of thermal expansion. And the result is that we get high thermal stresses and warping, failure of solder joints, crack, cracking or fracture of ceramics, and so forth. And because of that, uh, underfills are frequently used or com compliant polymeric interface materials. Now, if we go back uh, years, many years to the aerospace industry, People used copper invar copper laminates to constrain the coefficient of thermal expansion of fiberglass printed circuit board. And uh, by reducing the assembly coefficient of thermal expansion, they, we, we were able to eliminate solder joint failure. And uh, we did this many years ago at, when I was at General Electric. And what we're finding these days is that advanced thermal materials are replacing copper invar copper laminates. We have another question for our attendees. Would your designs benefit from thermal materials with low coefficients of thermal expansion that can minimize thermal stresses? Yes, no, or unsure? We'll give you 20 seconds to answer this question. 
Thank you. So having discussed traditional thermal materials as our taking off point, let's take a look at advanced thermal management materials. And what we find is that revolutionary materials are steadily emerging. The first new material, uh, usually called ALSIC in the industry, which stands for aluminum silicon carbide, dates to the 1980s. There are many other materials that are at various stages of development from R&D to high volume production. Some have very high thermal conductivities. Almost all have low CTEs and almost all have densities that are significantly lower than that of copper. Some are well established in an increasing number of production applications. The advantages of these materials are, as I said, thermal conductivity is up to 1700 watts per meter Kelvin, which is more than four times that of copper. Coefficients of, coefficients of thermal expansion can be tailored from minus two to plus 60 parts per million per degree Kelvin, which can match just virtually any material um, we would like to uh, consider. Some materials are cheaper than traditional ones. Some have tailorable electrical resistivities. Some have very high stiffnesses and strengths. Uh, most have, as I said, have low densities compared to copper. Hermetic materials are available and some can be made by net shape processes, which are processes that require no machining. Further, some of these processes allow the incorporation of ceramic substrates and feed-throughs, which reduces uh, labor cost. Disadvantages, some are higher cost. Um, there may be uh, the need for some development cost to implement the new materials into current designs or new designs. Some display hysteresis, um, not many. Some are hard to machine, uh, as are copper tungsten, for example. Some are hard to metallize, so that would, might require some development. Um, carbon aluminum uh, displays galvanic corrosion uh, potential and it may be possible to prevent this by plating the uh, component. And in addition, some display porosity, and again, plating may uh, correct the problem. I point out that um, aluminum castings often display porosity as well. The payoffs for advanced materials, reduction in size, weight, and power, improved thermal performance, which enables higher power levels, increased efficiency, reduced thermal stresses and warpage, which all of the above result in improved reliability. Um, possibly elimination of underfill by matching CTE. Uh, we actually did that with our copper and our copper constraining layers. Reduced electromagnetic emissions, increased manufacturing yield. We had a, a case at General Electric where we actually saved $60 million by uh, reducing the uh, frac failures during manufacture. And finally, there's potential for lower component and system cost. Let's take a look at the uh, various types of advanced thermal management materials. Um, one class of materials is monolithic carbonaceous materials, that is, various forms of carbon. And then we have composite materials, which we define as two or more materials bonded together. That distinguishes composites, for example, from alloys where one metal is dissolved in another. Composites have been used for many years. So for example, FR4 uh, glass epoxy printed circuit boards consist of a woven glass fabric and an epoxy matrix. Copper tungsten, as I mentioned, is a composite and so forth. We find that there are a number of different types of composites. We have polymer matrix composites, metal matrix composites, carbon matrix composites, ceramic matrix composites, and you can see all the abbreviations. And finally, we have uh, materials that some people consider alloys. Uh, they can also be considered composites, and I'm calling them metal, metal, alloys, dash composites. And as I mentioned, time constraint greatly limits materials covered. Attendees, we'd like to ask you another question. Is weight or mass important in your applications? 
Please select one. Yes, no, or unsure. We'll give you a few seconds to answer. Thank you. Let's take a look at the first type of advanced thermal materials, which is uh, mon monolithic carbonaceous materials. And again, these are just various forms of carbon. Uh, one of the most successful is called flexible graphite. For a while, it was called natural graphite. Uh, natural graphite is exfoliated graphite that's dug from the ground uh, and uh, processed. Um, the term flexible graphite may incorporate other forms of graphite. These are all flexible foil-like materials. We notice in plane thermal conductivity ranges from 140 to 1500. Um, 1500 is a more expensive material, and obviously you choose the, the one that has the, thermal con the type of thermal conductivity you need, that is the, the cheapest one that meets your thermal requirements. Um, flexible graphite is a family of highly anisotropic materials, which means materials vary with direction. So we have in-plane conductivities up to 1500, but the vertical or through thickness thermal conductivities are only in the range of 3 to 10 parts per million per degree Kelvin. Notice that the in-plane coefficient of thermal expansion is small, but it's actually negative. That's not a mistake which means that when you heat it, it contracts in the in-plane direction. And notice the density, which is actually considerably lower than that of aluminum, roughly one-third of density of aluminum, or, or uh, half the density of aluminum. Highly oriented pyrolytic graphite, abbreviated HOPG, is uh, another uh, carbonaceous material. It's weak. Uh, highly anisotropic, typically used with metal or composite encapsulants. We find in-plane thermal conductivities as high as 1,700 watts per meter Kelvin. And as I mentioned, this material is anisotropic, so the vertical or through thickness thermal conductivity is only in the range of 25 watts per meter Kelvin. And notice again that this material has a negative uh, but small in-plane coefficient of thermal expansion, coefficient of thermal expansion, and the density is uh, somewhat lower than that of aluminum, which is 2.7. Let's take a look now at composite materials. Composite materials, again, uh, defined as two or more materials bonded together. We have a number of different types of reinforcements. Upper left, we have continuous fibers. And we can take those continuous fibers using textile technology and create fabrics or braids. So for example, an FR4 printed circuit board consists of a glass fabric in an epoxy matrix. We have discontinuous fibers, uh, whiskers. Whisker is simply an elongated single crystal. And CNTs, these are carbon nanotubes, which really can be considered a, uh, which are very similar to uh, whiskers. And then we have particles or platelets. So these are the reinforcements, the key reinforcements that we use to make uh, composite materials. On this chart, we have the coefficient of the thermal expansion of ALSIC. Uh, this is the first uh, of a new generation of thermal materials. It goes back to the 1980s. And here we have, the, on the vertical axis, the coefficient of thermal expansion. On the horizontal axis, the particle volume fraction, the volume fraction of the silicon carbide particles. And you can see that as you increase the particle volume fraction, you wind up with an ALSIC material that has uh, lower and lower coefficient of thermal expansion. Uh, we have here materials made by a powder metallurgy process. That was the first material that we had back in the 1980s. And subsequently, uh, infiltration processes were developed which enable production of net shape uh, parts and with these uh, processes we can get down to coefficients of expansion as low as 4.8, lower than that of aluminum oxide and approaching that of uh, silicon. Uh, 
So as I mentioned, um, ALSIC, silicon carbide product of reinforced aluminum, is the first of a new generation of advanced thermal materials. And the work uh, in thermal management, or using the material thermal management, started uh, at GE in the, uh, the group that I headed uh, back in those days, at, um, back at General Electric. It's now well established in commercial and aerospace applications. <clears throat> it's now made by a number of processes and uh, multiple manufacturers. Some processes produce net shape parts, which require no machining. ALSIC parts can be significantly cheaper than that of copper tungsten or molycopper. One, <coughs> excuse me, one type is reportedly cheaper than copper. And as I mentioned, uh, Oipec and Finion found that replacing copper with ALSIC eliminated fatigue failure in their IGBT modules. As I mentioned, uh, there are a number of processes and companies making um, ALSIC composites, and the, which are MMCs, the upper right here, metal matrix composites. Particle volume fractions vary from 20 to 70 percent. And as we've seen, the particle volume fraction affects properties. So the thermal conductivities range between 130 and 255 watts per meter Kelvin. And 255 is higher than uh, all of the aluminum alloys that I'm aware of. You can tailor the CTE, as the chart showed. The density is in the range of aluminum alloys, maybe 10 percent higher, which is still uh, one third the density of copper. And one interesting property is that ALSTIC alloys typically have a high moduli, elastic moduli, which is very important in uh, fatigue applications. For example, uh, these materials are used in uh, printed circuit board cold plates, and we'll, we'll look at that later on. Another new material or advanced material is graphite platelet particle reinforced aluminum. It's a metal matrix composite. These materials are anisotropic, uh, whereas ALSIC is isotropic. Uh, material here is anisotropic, so we have high in-plane thermal conductivities, as high as 750, almost twice that of copper. And the vertical thermal conductivity is um, significantly lower. And you can see that uh, these two materials have low uh, coefficients of thermal expansion and lower densities than aluminum alloys. We have uh, a variety of advanced thermal materials, which consist of metal matrix composites with a variety of matrix materials, copper, aluminum, silver, cobalt, reinforced with diamond particles. These are isotropic materials, which means they get the same property in every direction. Uh, we don't have time to consider them all, all separately, but thermal conductivities have been measured as high as 983, so we're approaching 1,000 watts per meter Kelvin thermal conductivity in an isotropic material. Coefficient of thermal expansion can be varied between 4 and 12 parts per million per degree Kelvin. And the densities uh, depends on the, on the matrix alloy, but they are significantly lower than copper. Here's a material which is a ceramic matrix composite. It's produced by a company called Element 6, and they refer to it as silicon cemented diamond, um, abbreviated SCD. Originally, it was called uh, diamond silicon carbide by the original manufacturer of Skeleton Technologies. This is also an isotropic material. The uh, thermal conductivity is uh, 600. We actually measured 680 in one of our projects. It has a low CTE and a density um, 65% lower than copper, or roughly 60, 65% lower than copper. Um, we talked about using copper invar copper laminates to reduce the coefficient of thermal expansion of printed circuit board assemblies. Uh, and I mentioned that advanced thermal materials are now being used for that application. Here we have a carbon fiber reinforced polymer um, material. Um, plated with copper that is used uh, to constrain printed circuit board. And you can see that these materials are different types of fibers used. The in-plane thermal conductivity is quite low. And so you can use that 
uh, you can take that uh, take advantage of that by reducing the CTE of the printed circuit board. Uh, another advanced material is silicon aluminum, which can be considered an alloy or a composite. It's an isotropic material. Um, by varying the reinforcement volume fraction from 40 to 70 percent, you can tailor the CTE. Notice thermal conductivities are typically lower than that of many aluminum alloys, or lower than that of some aluminum alloys. Uh, density is quite low. And as we saw for ALSIC, the modulus is significantly higher than that of, uh, of aluminum. So if uh, vibration is a critical issue, this is uh, a useful material to consider. We'd like to ask one final poll question to our viewers. What industry do you work in? Please select one. Industrial Consumer Electronics, Industrial Consumer Photonics, Aerospace Defense Electronics, Aerospace Defense Photonics, or other? We'll give you a few seconds to answer. Thank you. Let's take a look now at uh, some uh, significant applications, representative applications for some of these materials. Uh, copper tungsten, as I mentioned, uh, is widely used in packaging. This go, these materials go back to the t certainly mid 20th centuries. Um, this is the th these this is the first uh, ALSIC module. That goes back to the mid 1980s. We were aiming at replacing Kovar, which is a nickel iron alloy with a lighter weight material, and the weight savings is about 65%, and we have 10 times the thermal conductivity of Kovar in this ALSIC uh, module. Here's a, a hybrid approach where we have a lead frame, a commercial lead frame made of uh, Kovar. The base plate is uh, ALSIC, so we have silicon carbide particles combined with aluminum to make this composite uh, base, which is uh, ALSIC. Uh, the first ALSIC parts that we made at GE were machined from plate. They cost certainly hundreds of dollars, possibly thousands of dollars to produce. With the new infiltration processes that have been developed, you can buy lids such as these in high volume for as little as two to five dollars a piece. So we've seen orders of magnitude decrease in uh, cost. Here's an example of the weight savings that you can achieve. Um, this is a um, power module that, the type that we, we use at GE in spacecraft applications. Um, we did not make the module, but we, uh, we did use it. The base plate here is ALSIC replacing copper tungsten with a weight savings of 85 percent, which is um, not too shabby. ALSIC power modules have been used in a variety of commercial, uh, industrial, and aerospace applications, such as the one shown here. Uh, this is another material. We didn't have time to talk about the properties, but this is carbon. Uh, this is aluminum reinforced with carbon fibers. These are microwave modules that are used. Uh, modules like this, uh, similar to these, are used in spacecraft phased array uh, antennas. I mentioned uh, diamond particle reinforced metals, uh, and my, my initial reaction was uh, that these are obviously too expensive to be even considered. But if you think about it, <clears throat> you look at industrial applications of uh, diamond particle reinforced metals, we find that diamond particle reinforced copper has been used for many, many years as industrial grinding wheels. And on the right, we have uh, diamond particle reinforced cobalt, uh, which is used in uh, rock drills. So my thought is that if these materials are cheap enough to be used in industrial applications, they certainly merit consideration, at least in high-end packaging. This is an example of a diamond uh, particle reinforced uh, silver. 
uh, base plate, and this is a gallium nitride uh, spacecraft package uh, developed um, in, in Europe. I mentioned uh, SCD, um, silicon cemented diamond, uh, originally called diamond particle reinforced silicon carbide by skeleton, and this is a uh, an SCD heat spreader. Um, heat spreaders like this were used in IBM servers for a number of years. One of the one of the significant things about packaging is that even if you're using liquid cooling. Um, you don't get away from the problem of coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch, which is typically a problem resulting from changes in ambient temperature. Uh, that is, thermal stresses arise from uh, different changes in ambient temperature when materials with different coefficients of thermal expansion are used. So here we have a, uh, an experimental liquid-cooled um, heat sink made from diamond particle reinforced uh, silicon carbide, that is SCD. Working our way up the packaging ladder, um, level two, which is the printed circuit board level. Here we have a printed circuit board cold plate, also called a heat sink or thermal plane. Um, this is used with typically a fiberglass printed, attached to a fiberglass printed circuit board. In addition to having the advantage of low coefficient of thermal expansion, which provides some constraint, it has a high um, stiffness to density, which is beneficial for uh, vibration critical applications. These are liquid cooled uh, ALSIC heat sinks, which are widely used in uh, air aircraft applications. Talked about flexible graphite, a carbonaceous material. It's used in smartphones, tablets, uh, notebook computers, and displays. Another material is highly oriented pyrolytic graphite. Uh, TC1050 is a trademark uh, of one of the uh, one of the types of highly oriented pyrolytic graphite. There are several producers, and here we have a highly oriented pyrolytic graphite. As I mentioned, it's used in an encapsulated form. And these are the two uh, layers of aluminum that are used to encapsulate the uh, pyrolytic graphite. I talked about uh, constraining printed circuit boards using uh, stable core, which is a carbon fiber reinforced polymer material. And here we have a, uh, a spacecraft supercomputer, uh, which uses a stable core enhanced um, printed circuit board. Some forms of stable core have high thermal conductivities, which um, provide a, a heat path for heat dissipation, in addition to providing constraint. This is an uh, electronic enclosure that incorporates metal matrix composites. Um, it has 2.4 times the thermal conductivity aluminum portions of this enclosure. And in addition, it's 10% lighter. And this is a commercial product. Turning now to photonics, um, this is some work we did at GE many years ago. Here we have a concentrator photovoltaic array where the light bounces off this mirror reflected onto a gallium arsenide photovoltaic cell which was attached to a beryllium oxide block. The original spiders supporting the block were aluminum. Big difference in coefficient of thermal expansion between beryllium and aluminum and uh, resulting in solder joint failure. So what we did was to design carbon fiber reinforced aluminum spiders where we matched the coefficient of expansion of beryllium oxide and eliminated the solder joint failure. Here are some other photonic applications, uh, solid state lightings using flexible graphite for heat dissipation. This is what's called a hybrid approach. And here we have a thermoelectric cooler substrate which is pr composed primarily of ALSIC, but in the pedestal area uh, where the, the thermoelectric cooler is attached, they are using a TPG, which is a type of highly oriented pyrolytic graphite as a heat spreader. So this is, a uh, again, a hybrid approach utilizing two advanced materials. If we look at future directions, uh, it's clear that thermal management will continue to be a problem in electronics and photonics. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, 3D architecture adds complexity to the heat dissipation problem and also uh, 
thermal stresses. I anticipate continuing development of new materials, both monolithic carbonaceous composites, uh, thermal interface materials. This is a very significant area that we have not touched on uh, except in passing in this presentation. I expect to see uh, continuing development of reinforcements such as carbon nanotubes, uh, carbon nanofibers, graphite platelets. I expect to see continuing use of diamond particles and other electrically uh, insulating reinforcements. I think there's great potential for materials that are thermally conductive but electrically insulating. These would typically be composite materials. One interesting development, uh, a recent paper um, indicated that the authors had measured a thermal conductivity for one type of spider silk of 400 watts per meter Kelvin, which is the thermal conductivity of copper. If verified, this could open the door to inherently thermally conductive polymers, which would be a very exciting possibility. And numerous other materials are possible. To summarize, um, thermal management is a critical problem in electronic and photonic systems. Both heat dissipation and thermal stresses arising from CTE mismatch. Size, weight, and power are all important. Traditional thermal materials have significant deficiencies. And in response to that, industry is developing, uh, material suppliers are developing an increasing number of advanced materials with thermal conductivities up to 1,700 watts per meter Kelvin, low tailorable coefficients of thermal expansion, low densities. Some are cheaper than traditional materials and the number of applications in electronics and photonics are increasing steadily. Finally, uh, th this technology, advanced thermal materials, only goes back about three decades. In the history of technology, three decades is the blink of an eye. So I think it's safe to say that we're in the very early stages of a thermal materials revolution. Thank you so much, Carl. We would like to have a call for final questions. Please enter any last questions you may have in the navigation pane. We have received quite a few inquiries on where to get additional information on this topic. There is a vast amount of content found on our website, www.electronics-cooling.com. You can also email us at info at electronics-cooling.com with specific needs and we can direct you accordingly. Carl, here's a question for you. What are the costs of the various materials you covered? Well, the cost is a complex issue. It depends on many factors, such as uh, part size, complexity, flatness requirements, uh, roughness requirements, plating, um, the, the number of pieces in a production run. Uh, in the, in the uh, final analysis, the, the only way to get a good handle on cost is to ask for a firm a fixed quote from the material supplier. Here's a question on thermal conductivity. How do you deal with the low vertical thermal conductivities of some of the materials, such as highly oriented pyrolytic graphite? The first thing to do is to use an anisotropic finite element model or other analytic model, analytical model, to determine whether the through thickness and in-plane properties of the material are adequate as is. And it may very well be that, that uh, that's the case. If not, there are tricks that you can use like uh, implementation of thermal vias and heat slugs. Here's another good question. What is the future of carbon nanotubes in thermal materials? Single wall nanotubes have measured thermal conductivities as high as 3,000 watts per meter Kelvin. The theoretical prediction of Smalley is 6,000 watts per meter Kelvin. However, carbon nanotubes are quite small, resulting in many thermal interfaces, which cause phonon scattering. In general, I believe we need more research in this area. We have another thermal conductivity question. How does the thermal conductivity of polymer matrix composites 
reinforced with discontinuous carbon fibers compared to the other materials you discussed? There are many different types of carbon fibers. Some have thermal conductivities as high as 2,000 watts per meter kelvin. Composites made from long, continuous fibers can have in-plane conductivities as high as 300 watts per meter kelvin. Injection molding compounds using discontinuous fibers have much lower thermal conductivities. However, many, there are many applications that are convection limited, and the thermal conductivities of these materials, these injection molding compounds, have been shown to be adequate in some cases. Carl, can you comment on graphene, which has received a lot of interest lately? Graphene is composed of a single layer of carbon atoms arranged in a hexagonal array. All of the thermally conductive carbonaceous materials we discussed in this presentation are composed, uh, composed of multiple graphene layers. So graphene is really uh, nothing new. And finally, are there ways to use some of the more expensive materials in cost-sensitive applications? There may be applications for which expensive materials are cost-effective as is. However, there are many cases where it, is not, where it is not necessary to make the entire component out of one material. In this case, the expensive material, which typically has a very high thermal conductivity, is used in combination with cheaper materials. And we place the um, more expensive materials in regions where heat dissipation is most critical. This is referred to as a hybrid approach. The thermoelectric cooler I showed earlier, or the substrate uh, that I showed earlier, which combined highly oriented pyrolytic graphite and ALSIC, is a good example of the hybrid approach. We have received so many great questions. We will try to review them and address them in the future. Carl, thank you again for your time and expertise. Webinar attendees, if you have any more questions that we didn't answer here, please send us an email at info at electronics-cooling.com. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website, www.electronics-cooling.com. We will also send a link of the recording to all participants shortly. Thank you for attending.